For those of you keeping up and following along, we've been doing this series called Majoring on the Minors, and we're looking at all of the minor prophets. And so we have been looking at all 12. Well, this is the 11th one today, so next week we finish up this uh, series. And we're looking at the book of Zechariah. Now, before I talk about Zechariah, I have another question for you, and that is this. How many of you have read either the entire book or parts of the book of Revelation? Probably a fair number of you, I imagine. How many of you have ever been really uh, freaked out by reading the book of Revelation? Yeah, there's some wild stuff in there, isn't there? Uh, there are, are crazy visions, and we've got bowls of judgment, and and the horsemen of the apocalypse, and it's uh, some of this, this language is kind of hard to understand. It's You're getting uh, pictures and glimpses and visions and bits and pieces of things to try to put together, and it can be kind of really confusing and at times uh, frightening. Some people find its wild visions and apocalyptic language to be fascinating. I know people who are so obsessed, they spend all of their time in the book of Revelation. Maybe they throw little Daniel in there, and they just spend all of their time in the scriptures. That's where they go. They are just consumed with that. I think others are a little terrified to read Revelation, so they kind of stay away from it. <laughs> well, the reason I mention that is to say this. Zechariah is referred to as the apocalypse of the Old Testament. And in Zechariah, will, you will find very similar language. You will find some of these same types of visions and revelations and, and apocalyptic language that is very similar to the book of Revelation. The prophecy itself is largely all about Jesus Christ, as we will soon discover. More so than many of the other prophets, Zechariah is constantly speaking about Jesus. What's interesting is he does not have the same viewpoint that we do. He's looking ahead at something that's almost 500 years from his vantage point of happening. We look back on something that's already happened, right? When we look at Christ, we look at the, his life, we look at the cross, which we'll, which we'll celebrate today. We celebrate the body and the, and the blood of our Savior today. We celebrate communion. And so we're looking back at something that's already happened, where he's looking forward at something that hasn't happened, and the Lord is giving him little, little snippets, little glimpses, little viewpoints that are not complete. And yet he's fascinated by what the Lord gives him. It's interesting to think about the fact that even angels were fascinated about the idea of God sending his son to earth and how that would transpire. Did you ever think of that? Angels themselves, here they are in heaven. They ought to know. You'd think they would know everything that's about to happen, but even they long to look in to the very... A message of salvation. We find that actually in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. Peter says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Fascinating. So even the angels are fascinated by this idea of our salvation and, and how that came to be. We sometimes, I think, take for granted and don't realize what a wonderful salvation that we have. Even the angels are intrigued by it. And the prophets were looking forward to it, not knowing exactly how all that's going to work out. It's tempting to take that salvation for granted, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we come together is every time we approach the Word, we get, a, we get another new glimpse at just how wonderful our salvation is. We get another glimpse at our Savior. We get another look in Scripture, and we're informed more, and we grow in that understanding. All right. Now, who was, who was Zechariah, you might ask? Well, we know that he was a priest as well as a prophet. He would have been a contemporary of Haggai. So if you were here last week, you heard all about Haggai. 
Zachariah would have been a contemporary of his. So we're talking the same time frame. We're talking the, the group of exiles from Babylon, that, the remnant that went back to Judah. Zechariah would have been part of that crowd. In fact, his grandfather, Ido, was also in that group of exiles who first returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. All right, so we kind of now we kind of know who he is. We we have a time frame from wh for where he is, and we also discover this according to tradition, he was a member of the great synagogue, a council of 120 originated by Nehemiah and presided over by Ezra. This council later developed into the ruling elders of the nation called the Sanhedrin. Now, some of you say, oh, I know what that is, right? You remember Jesus had some encounters with the Sanhedrin, right? So Zechariah is one of the kind of one of the founding guys of what would become the Sanhedrin. We also have an account where Jesus himself mentions Zechariah by name. And it is in his condemnation of the scribes and the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, Jesus is referring to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. That's the same Zechariah that we're going to look at today that was murdered uh, by the religious leaders at that time. But today we're going to look at three revelations that speak of our wonderful Savior. We're going to look in chapter 9 at the coming of the King, chapter 11 at the crucifixion of the King, and verse, uh, chapter 14 at the coronation of the King. Now, as we approach these prophecies, what I want you to do is kind of put your prophecy lenses on. And, and, and in some way, you putting your prophecy lenses on is going to actually dull your vision a little bit. Because that's really what the, the prophet is dealing with, right? He doesn't see completely clearly like you and I are able to look back in history. Well, that's what happened. We know certain things. He's looking at pictures and glimpses and shadows. And so I want you to kind of do that with me as we take a look at some of these prophecies. Imagine you're looking into the future with Zechariah. He's, he's about to describe a king who will come to Israel. And as you hear his words, you might actually recognize having heard these words before. Think about the coming king. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, that's a Palm Sunday uh, occasion. We, we look at this passage. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Obviously, this passage in Zechariah is one that we typically hear every Palm Sunday. It describes Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and in spite of so much that is unknown to the prophet, he knows that this Savior that is coming is, is a king who brings salvation, he is humble, and he brings peace. Imagine that this coming king would have salvation. We celebrate that, don't we? We celebrate that salvation is found in no one else but through Christ Jesus. He alone can bring the forgiveness of sins for all mankind. And notice the Messiah that Zechariah describes is a Savior who brings salvation, not a military leader who the Jews wanted to over, overthrow the Roman Empire. There are many passages in the Old Testament, in the prophets, that we can look at with 2020 vision and say, my goodness, how did the Pharisees not see this? How did the people of Israel not see, How did the priests not see this? Clearly, Jesus was to be a suffering servant. Jesus was to be a humble king riding on a donkey, not riding in a chariot as an overcoming, conquering king taking over Rome. We could say, how in the world did, did they miss all this? But you see, far too many people today still want to have a savior of their own imaginations 
instead of the Savior that Scripture tells us of, right? We, we would like a Savior that says, yeah, that sin that you seem to really love to keep doing, that's okay, I have no problem with that. We, we want a Savior that says, go ahead and keep doing whatever you want. We want a Savior that says, you live your life your way. I'll, I'll stay out of your way and leave you alone. <laughs> we can be just as guilty of wanting a Savior that Scripture never described. Just as the Pharisees and the priests did the same thing, didn't they? They wanted a Savior who would come and knock off Rome and set them free from physical bondage when he came to deliver them from spiritual bondage and give them true salvation. That king who came on the donkey came to bring salvation for our sins. But we also see this idea that this coming king is a humble king. And I love how Zechariah is given this, at least this much in this revelation, that this king that would come would be a humble king. Very different also from the kings of this world, right? A humble king. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says this, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so, to, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No greater example of humility than the one who would allow himself to be put to death for crimes he did not commit to redeem people who did not love him. I don't think we could come up with a better def definition of humility, could we? That he'd be willing to do that for us still amazes me to this day that he would love me. No surprise then that he's worthy of our praise priests of Jesus' time somehow missed the fact that their coming Messiah would be a humble servant, not a military leader. But Zechariah himself prophesied that that's exactly what he would be, a humble king. And it also says here that, in verse 10, that his coming would speak peace to the nations. In Isaiah, we find Jesus described as the prince of peace, right? Right? Zechariah says he speaks peace to the nations, and we recognize that only in the eternal reign of Christ will we ever find peace on earth. To some degree or another, over, over eons of time, there's been more peace and less peace, right? Depending on what, what nations are in control and what things are going on. But there's never been complete and total peace, because without Christ, there can't possibly be. However, where can we encounter that peace? Within each one of our hearts, right? We, we understand peace from the standpoint of being made right with God. We now have peace with God, and so we are no longer in terror from God because we know that we've been made right through faith in Christ. And so peace is something that is given to us individually, but we do look forward to that time when all nations will yield to the King of Kings, and there will be peace ultimately on earth. But a fascinating look at a coming king, pictures and glimpses from the prophet Zechariah, who speaks of this coming king who will be humble, who will speak peace, who will bring salvation. Now, not only did Zechariah get a, a picture of Jesus as the coming king, but he also describes the crucifixion of the king. Again, I want to I help you here because we, we need to understand we're reading apocalyptic prophecy, and it's, it's a complex blending of glimpses and pictures. But again, hear with me the words of the crucifixion from the standpoint of somebody looking from 500 years away, looking into the future. We're going to look at chapter 11, uh, verses 7 through 14. So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. And I took two staffs, one I named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. In one month I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. 
And I took my staff, favor, and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. So it was annulled on that day, and the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, If it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. What are the wages? What is this shepherd who is destined to be slaughtered worth? And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and pieces of silver back into the temple, which was then used to, to do what? By the potter's yield. Fascinating. Uh, these verses describe Jesus' ministry and ultimate crucifixion at the hands of the Jews. Jesus becomes the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered. And it becomes easy then for us to see a picture of Jesus, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. But notice in verse 8, it gives us this kind of odd language here. It says that he destroyed the three shepherds. Who are the three shepherds? Any of you wondering that? Somebody is, I'm sure of it. Throughout most of church history, it has been interpreted that this refers to the priests, the elders, and the scribes of Israel, who were the shepherds leading Israel. And Jesus destroyed all three of those, didn't he? Because what you find is after the resurrection, he establishes the church. And the this role of priest, scribe, and elder is gone. And who then becomes those who lead the church? this new institution that Christ brings about. As you come to him, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be what? A holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Zechariah prophesies that Christ will come and will put an end to the, the, the false leadership of the priests, the scribes, and the elders, and replaces it with the priesthood of all believers. Now this is a beautiful thing of wonder that, that to this day is a beautiful thing about the church. Do we have things like pastors and deacons and trustees and things that have dele people that have delegated responsibilities? Yes. Where is the ultimate authority in the church? It's found in everyone together being able to hear God's voice speaking to them and through them. That's the one of the amazing things about the church is that God speaks to every single one of the, the, of the people through his word and through his spirit. And so it isn't that well, you know, we have a pastor, and the pastor, he hears from God, and that's it. No, not at all. God speaks through Ron, and God speaks through LaRue, and God speaks through Rose, and God speaks through Preston, and God speaks through Liz, and God speaks through Bart. What? We're all part of the same body. And so this idea of the priesthood of all believers replacing the corrupt leadership that was found in the time of Jesus of the priests and the scribes and the elders. Isn't that a, be a beautiful and a wonderful thing? The fact that God would speak through each one of us. And it also makes it to the point where, well, we better listen to each other too, hadn't we? Because if we all have the same Holy Spirit within us and God's trying to speak to us, then I might need to listen. Uh, but what an amazing thing. And, and, and this is something that is, is really fascinating. And again, we're... Zechariah is looking through glimpses and kind of a foggy picture at what's to happen, but we're able to look back and we're able to see this come into, into play. Now, Zechariah prophesies that the Messiah will come. He will abolish the three false shepherds of the priests. And the other thing that I want us to see in this section is verse 13, uh, Zechariah 11:13. 13. 
The Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the thirty pieces of silver, threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So We kind of we kind of all thought that right. Here's where we here's where we find this in the New Testament. Matthew Matthew twenty six fourteen and fifteen. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, "What will you give me if I deliver him over to you?" And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And then in Matthew twenty seven six and seven, but the chief priest taking the piece of pieces of silver, after Judas had. <laughs> thrown the money back to them the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money so they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers in this prophecy about the crucifixion of the king found in Zechariah chapter 11 and lastly I want to look at this coronation of the king chapter 14 we're going to look at verses 6 through 9. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost. And there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name, one. Interesting. Description of living waters. Description of day during nighttime. And the description of one who has now been coronated as king and rules supremely over all. What do you think he might be describing in there, anyone? It's a picture of heaven. This is this is the 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 time where there's no more there's no more war there's no more struggle there's no more sickness or or darkness. But we're talking of heaven, light even at nighttime, living waters flowing, the Lord being king over all the earth. Remember how I said Zechariah and Revelation are kind of similar. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Through glimpses and pictures, the great prophet Zechariah has now shown us our wonderful Savior, the King who came, the King who was crucified, and the King who invites us to his coronation. Which leaves us with the question, are you ready to go to meet him? Those who, those who go to this place that is described both in Zechariah and Revelation are those whose robes have been made white. How does that happen? Because they have confessed their sin and repented of it and placed their faith in the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. That's how. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for these, these glimpses, these, these pictures that were given to the prophets as they looked forward in time at the great salvation that we would now encounter and celebrate. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you have fulfilled those prophecies, and you have come, and you have shed your blood, and provided forgiveness of sin and eternal life to all those who would repent and place their faith in you. Thank you for the hope of eternal life, that we could part, be a part of the coronation of our, of, our, of our Savior and be with you eternally. 
thank you for the promise of your word. In Christ's name, amen.